Well, good morning, Faith Church. It's Thursday, 10 a.m., and we are here for Bible study. So, so glad that you're joining in together. We're going to start with a song today. This is a song called I Am Welcome, and it's written by Brian Sergio, who is a United Church of Christ minister from Wisconsin. He writes contemporary Christian music, uh, used a lot in mainline churches. And this chorus is very, very simple. The words are very, very simple, and the tune is very, very simple. And I think it's uh, appropriate and a good uh, message for us to start today. So it's, I, I am welcome. I am welcome. I am welcome. I am loved just as I am. I am welcome. You are welcome. We are loved just as we are. Oh, Spirit, burn that truth into our hearts. You are welcome. You are welcome. You are loved just as you are. You are welcome. I am welcome. We are loved just as we are. Oh, Spirit, burn that truth into our hearts. We are welcome. We are welcome. as we are. We are welcome. We are welcome. We are loved just as we are. Oh Spirit, burn that truth into our hearts. All right, let's take a moment and pray together. God, we are so grateful to be here, to gather in your name, and to open up your word. God, there is a lot going on in our lives and around us, and we need you. And we open our hearts to your spirit to give us strength and to give us a sense of stability and safety and to experience your overwhelming love and we ask that if there is anything for us to learn in this moment if there's anything that we need to release in this moment and if there's anything that we need to do for you in this moment we ask that as we open your word and steady it that you would convict us and encourage us and direct us we love you, we trust you, and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. I am going to say hello to uh, a few people here and just want to um, let you know that... Uh, because there's been a lot going on, as particularly the last few weeks... Uh, there's been more of me talking and less of you talking. Of course, that's kind of the format, I guess. But I want to encourage you that um, today, if you would like to, we can start our time together with some questions or with some comments. So you're welcome to leave them there uh, next to the live feed in, in Facebook. And... Uh, will respond accordingly. So I do, there is about a 30 second delay in what I'm live streaming to you and when you see it on Facebook. So if you sense that there is a little bit of time in between, that's, that's the nature of this, of this particular live stream. So first and foremost, let's say hello and welcome to Wilma and Judy and to Jim and Deb, to Karen and Mike, and to Beverly and Diane, 
to Jason and to Bob and Carol, to Anita and to Jeffrey. Hello to each and every one of you this morning. So glad that you've joined in today. And I do have uh, a few readings that we will um, we will look at. We'll be using this book today. I know it's a hit and miss. You don't know if I'm going to use it or not use it, but we will use it today, our Emotionally Healthy Spirituality Day by Day. There's some good readings for us today that I think uh, will will uh, give us some encouragement, and so we'll look at that today. Uh, but again, if you do have anything that you would like to comment on or to question or add, uh, we're happy to do that. Normally we do that as we, as we gather together. So as I'm waiting for your comments, just a few, um, I guess a few comments of, of my own. Uh, I have had a, a good amount of response from you uh, regarding the sermon this past Sunday. And uh, so, I guess I could share with you a little bit about uh, my process. I can see we've got a, a statement here already. Um, where is the faith family on recent events? So Jason, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, well, first, uh, of course, uh, something that has been a big influence on everything that we encounter uh, whether it's, you know, whatever the topic is in the news or our personal lives, everything is being impacted by uh, coronavirus, the pandemic. And we're, we are, oh my goodness, how many, April, May, June, we're, we're about th three months into this uh, thing. It's been a long three months. Uh, we've gone through tremendous changes. Uh, in uh, in our personal lives and, and around us. And then uh, a few weeks ago, uh, you know, we had uh, yet another incident of uh, injustice uh, to a person of color by by the police or by by authorities. Now, um, this the the topic of racism in America is uh, is very it's it's a it's a part of our history that's that goes back to its very beginnings. Uh, the um, it's it's always it's always been a part race and and the complexities of race relations has always been a big part of American society. Uh, it is a, a huge part of the Civil War in, uh, in our country. And it uh, is also just been right then and there with us all along the way. So I'm sure that each and every one of you has uh, different experiences, uh, different personal experiences with, uh, with race relationships and your understanding of race in America. Uh, the church, uh, our church, uh, Faith Church, is, is a mostly uh, white American church, and, and we do have some Hispanic, some African American, some, uh, I guess you'd say Caribbean American. Um, so we do have some race mix within our congregation, but I'd say predominantly we're pretty pretty much a mostly white congregation and we've got folks from that uh, originate f or, or they come from different places within the United States. Um, so uh, we do have um, we do have people you know from Pennsylvania, New York, Michigan, uh, New Jersey, uh, I'm from the South. I, I grew up. Uh, I grew up kind of moving around the South because my father was being moved from church to church. He was a pastor, but I, I grew up in the South: North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia, uh, predominantly. So, um, 
everybody has kind of a different a different take. Some of us grew up in more urban areas and some grew up in more rural areas. Uh, some grew up in, in more homogenous uh, cultures, you know, everybody was the same color and kind of thought the same way, or there was a mixture. So e each one of those, you know, it plays a part in our, in the way that we feel just our just our gut feeling, just the visceral reaction that we have to talking about race or to engaging in and having relationships with people that are not the same race as us. Um, race plays a, a, a huge part of what these protests are all about. Black Lives Matter, that's about race. Uh, there's also a, a large element that's that's always present uh, within our culture as well, and that is that we uh, come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. We have different uh, levels of education, and those things play a huge part. Uh, some, sometimes if you, if you look at the divides within uh, America, there's, there may be more divides along socioeconomic lines than there are along the lines of race. And when you mix those two together, it's, it's, even, it's even more complex. I think uh, as a Christian, uh, what we hope to do in every situation that we encounter is what we, what we hope to do is we hope to take the teachings of Christ, the teachings of the church, and we hope to use that as kind of our, our greatest influence in the way that we see the things around us. So, uh, for example, we may look to Jesus and, and how he related to people that were not Jewish to see what uh, would be a good response. In, in one situation or another. We also look to uh, the teachings of, of the early Christians or, the, or the, uh, the generation that, you know, that follows Jesus. We look to the apostles and to their, their talking about uh, race. Um, we recently talked, I think it was last week, we looked at one of the teachings of the apostle Paul and he talked about, we looked at the the difference between being Jewish and being Gentile. Well, that was about race. And uh, if, you, if you look at the beliefs of the Jewish people, it was that, that God chose that group of people. So in a, in a way, God chooses that particular race of people. This is, you know, this is a group of people that's bound together by their blood and uh, with a strong emphasis on not intermarrying with people that are not of the same blood pool. So in, in a lot of ways, what the Apostle Paul was facing was not just a religious or theological issue when he says things like the gospel opens up who is in God's family, no longer is it based on, on who, who you're born to, what family you're born into. That was what determined whether you were a part of the people of God for, for centuries upon centuries, according to the Hebrew scriptures and according to the way that people thought at, at Jesus' time. So for him to come in and say, that when you accept the message of the gospel, when you follow Jesus, when, when the teachings and life and experience of Jesus is foremost and central to your faith, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and that makes you a part of God's people, that's a strong statement against a religion that's based upon race. And it's, it was more based upon race than it was based upon whether you followed a, a group of laws or not. There, there were ways for people to convert to Judaism, but Judaism has never been a religion that is 
um, that tries to make converts, that tries to bring more people in. It's never that's never been a part of its of its DNA, and it's not even today. So the um, the uh, the message there with Paul is that. Um, All right, there's feedback like you're talking over yourself. Um, I'm, I'm getting a message that, that the sound is not as great. And so, oh goodness. Um, well, all I can hope to do right now is just, uh, is just to continue on. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sorry, some of you may be hearing uh, differently than others. Uh, but we'll just have to rely on the video after uh, the service uh, and hope that that uh, corrects the issue. Uh, the, the, the blessings and the curses of Internet. So the Apostle Paul comes in and his message is that it is by faith, it is by faith that we overcome and we go beyond where we used to think in terms of race relations and and it, you know if we went back if i if i pull up so we were looking at galatians 3 and so the, the text that we read last time was, there's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. So the answer, according to Apostle Paul, is that it's through faith. It's through something bigger than laws, uh, and human effort that we reach the place where we can truly experience transformation. Now, we will experience transformation through, uh, through protest. We will experience transformation through, uh, th through pressure on those in political positions of authority that can make changes to laws and that can force people to to change behavior all right there's some transformation in that regard the apostle paul talks about it he it says you know if you, if you're trying to live by the law there is something there that will benefit your life it's it's better to live by the law than to not live by the law okay that's agreed but what he's saying is that it is deep, true, long-lasting transformation comes through faith. And, and that, the transformation of faith will address issues of race, that's Jew or Greek. It will address issues of socioeconomic inequality, slave or free. It will address issues of us not understanding what, how best to use the roles of gender and, and the differences of gender to our best benefit and to not uh, consider one to be more valuable than another or one to be superior to another or uh, it, it, it means it means using male and female in the way that that God intended it is to, to supplement and to create wholeness and so but this transformation is by faith it's by faith now how does that how does that work it's a good question <laughs> because I don't know that we fully understand uh, faith Yesterday, I was talking to my wife, and, and one of the things that, 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 uh, that we were discussing is, what, what do you have faith in? Because we can have faith in a lot of things. You know, you can have faith or not have faith 
in, in the goodness of humanity, or you can have faith or not have faith in, in the rule of law, or you can have faith or not have faith in your, in your society or in your culture. Okay, so you can, you can have faith in many different things. The faith that we're talking about here is faith in God. That means faith in the revelation that Christ brings to us, but ultimately what Christ is bringing us to is faith in God. And, and we've talked about over the last few weeks, the nature of God is mysterious and unknown, and we do have little tiny tastes of what God is like through the scriptures, through the teachings and example of Jesus, we do have some kind of insight, but we have to realize that the amount that we know about God compared to everything God is, is just ridiculously small. <laughs> we, and so what we often try to do is within our religious systems is we try to come up with these formulas or these descriptions or these beliefs to say this is what God is like. God is like this. God is not like that. All right. And then what happens is we get into disagreements of, as people of faith. Christians disagree and then Christians disagree with non-Christians. The, 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 the nature of who God is the, the purpose and the will of who God is, all of that we disagree about, but we're not disagreeing about God. We're disagreeing about our beliefs in God. So the question is, do you have faith in your beliefs? Do you have faith in your perspective? Do you have faith in what you know about God? Or do you have faith which means you don't know. Do you have faith in the unknown God, in the God that none of us know, the God that we, that we cling to, that we worship, that we adore, that we love, but we just don't know anything about God. We just know a little. Jesus points us in the right direction, and Jesus says, Jesus focuses on are probably he focuses on what are our biggest obstacles. And if he can help us with those obstacles, then that can lead us into this faith in the unknown. So that's the, that's the big, um, you know, on Sunday when, when I talked about faith, one of the things that I was feeling is, you know, I was feeling like, like we do as Christians from time to time, this crisis of faith. And the crisis of faith is everything that you know, everything that you believe and everything that you hold on to is not quite working. Everything that you hope for and everything that you envisioned and your, all your expectations are not being met. And, and, and what, what is revealed in that moment is that, is that there was a part of our faith that we had faith in our perspective, we had faith in our beliefs, we had faith in our expectations, we had faith in this picture we had of God. That's what we had faith in. So maybe it's a good thing to lose your faith in that. There are, there are many people that I have met that say that they're either agnostic or atheist, and they say, I cannot have faith in that. And what they're talking about when they say, I can't have faith in that, is they can't have faith in another person's or group of people's perspective or set of beliefs or teachings about the nature of God. And so they've lost their faith in that. They've lost their faith in other people's perspectives and beliefs and conclusions. 
And you know what? There's probably nothing wrong with that. In fact, if you reach that point, you may actually be closer to having real faith than if you still were holding on to faith in your beliefs and your perspective and so on. So we, we need to get to a place where we are having faith in God and faith means it's trust without knowing. It's trust without knowing. I think if we look at kind of the key text for this is Hebrews 11. It, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then it goes on to, you know, this uh, Hebrews 11, this is the faith chapter. So it talks about all these different people throughout the, the, the Hebrew timeline and how their faith was to a great, it was a great benefit to them. All right. And, and then it goes on and on through uh, the people of the Old Testament, and then it, it makes its way uh, to us. And then at the end it says, All these, that were though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not apart from us be made perfect. So this is, this is talking again about what do you have faith in you had faith in a belief system you had a faith in a in a group of people called by god you had you have faith in these things and that's a good thing you know get you a lot of places but eventually to get to a place of faith where we're totally dependent on the unknown god the god of the unknown <clears throat> we don't know what's going to happen next we don't know how god is using the different things of our life. We don't know exactly what we need to give up. We don't know what we need to embrace. We don't know. Faith means holding on to something we don't know. And that just, it, it logically, it doesn't make any sense because usually what we hold on to is the things that we do know and that we can have some sense of and, and meaning of and control of. But to have faith in God and not know, to have faith and be in darkness and still moving forward in faith that's that's what we're called to now how do we how do we take that and put it into uh present circumstances well th these are some of the things that i think that we need to address as humanity and as people of the united states is uh, uh, we need to be aware of the vast socioeconomic disparities that we have among ourselves. There, there is greater disparity between the richest and the poorest than there has ever been in human history. And we will be feeling the impacts of what we have created in that, in that part of our life until, you know, there's always going to be this tug and pull because it just, um, not only because it's not right, because it, it brings so much disrupts, disruption to so many people's lives. And, and that comes out of, you know, big disparities come out of having a set of priorities that's just out of whack. We in the United States have put such an emphasis on materialism and on financial success, it's so ingrained, isn't that the American dream? It's the, it's the land of opportunity. Opportunity for what? Yes, you may have more freedoms and a chance to raise your family in a better environment, but there's a big part of the American dream that has to do with money and has to do with financial success and has to do with changing your status in the socioeconomic realm of the country and the world. So uh, we've got dis disparity, we've got uh, issues with money, okay? Then on top of that, we're more and more and more, not only in the United States, but around the world, we're more and more of a melting pot 
and a coming together of people that don't understand each other than we've ever been before. You, you used to be able to live your entire life living around people just like you. And you never had to experience somebody that was very different than you were. The language they spoke, the way that they looked, the culture that they brought with them, and, and their, their sense of what's important in life and how they see things and how they make decisions. If you're around people that are similar to you, it's going to be easier to go through life than it is if you've got a lot of different people from a lot of different places. Now, this is not going to go away. This is the nature of the world from here on out. We've, this is one of those things you can't undo. We're not going to go back to dividing up the world and, and, and making these strong, impenetrable pockets of homogenous people groups. That's not going to happen. We're going to keep mixing together. And that's just our reality, but that is something that will create tension and anxiety and stress. So we got economics, we've got race. All right, now there's another part, and, and I, I, I don't bring this up a lot, even in Bible study, because I get, there's a lot of kickback to this, and I even struggle with this myself, but I, I try to examine what is it about the nature of violence that, uh, how, how should we relate to that as people of faith? Now, Here's the big challenge, is that if you're looking for a place that's free of violence, if you want to read a book that's free of violence, the Bible is not the place for that. <laughs> the Bible is full of violence from the first book to the last book. And there are some places in between that do talk about peace and love and getting along. There's a lot of that in there. But there's a lot of violence within the scriptures. And, and so if we're looking to the scriptures for the question of how do we address issues of violence, I think we're going to be more dependent upon the Holy Spirit leading us to those conclusions and looking for the places in the Bible that should raise above uh, kind of a higher perspective of where we should be. Now, will we ever get rid of violence? You know, prob probably not. But I think we could agree that it's better to live a life with less violence than it is with more violence. All right, and there's all, t there's all types of violence. But the question is, where, where should we stand in perspective to this? This is a very tough one. And I've gone, I've tried to go in my own thinking around the block and around the, the perspective on violence. And, um, you know, violence is something that you look at in terms of the way that you raise your children. Okay, there's, there's debates on should you spank or should you not spank? And, and there's the question of, uh, you know, of physical abuse, okay? So it, it's, in, it's in the family. The, the, one of the, the texts here in Galatians that talks about there's no male and female, we've got big problems understanding one another as men and women, and that probably leads to a lot of domestic violence because there's misunderstanding, there's mistrust, uh, there's not a coming together of differences, but there is a fear of the differences and, and there's a, just the overwhelming challenge of communication in, in relationships and families. So we've got violence there. We, we see in, de, in these demonstrations and in the events that led to these demonstrations, when we have our, our communities, whether it's you know, our city or our county, or our state, when we're trying to enforce the laws, the question is, you know, where does violence come in, in to, to this place? So 
you know, many, many people would say that we can't make a difference without some kind of violence or threat of violence. And if we look back at human history, we've never done it before. We've always had violence as a part of the equation, whether it's, whether it's put into force or whether it is uh, uh, the threat of violence. I remember listening to a guy who, who talked about that the law leads to violence. And, and what his point was is that if you stand up to the law, it will eventually end in violence uh, because it, it goes from you get a, a warning to you get a fine to you, you get somebody showing up at your house with a gun on their hip saying, if you don't get in the car so that we can take you to jail because you've broken the law, then I'm going to have to threaten you with violence. So um, the threat of violence is just, it's, it's like ingrained into our, into our culture uh, as a way of keeping the law, as a way of raising our children, as a way of keeping relationships. You know, there's always, it's always an option in the way that we relate to one another. And the question is, as people of faith, as Christians, uh, as people understanding the deepest revelation of what Jesus is trying to, to give to us, how do, we, how do we relate to that? Now, there is something within our culture, you have to agree, that there is more and more a, of an acceptance and even an enjoyment of violence. All right? Our sports are violent. I, you know, I, I remember growing up, the most violent thing you'd see would be a boxing match, and now you have ultimate cage fighting where there are almost no rules, and, and people are beating one another until one of them submits or, or goes unconscious. This is entertainment. Uh, it's hard to watch a, a movie or a series on television that doesn't use violence as some type of a form of entertainment. And, you know, and, and I get it. I, I understand the nature of the entertainment of violence because I have felt it before. You know, you watch a movie and you see uh, something getting or somebody getting shot up or stabbed or beat up or whatever. And if it's done in some artistic, entertaining way, it's like, whoa, that was so cool, or that was amazing, or wow, or it just, you know, it makes you kind of be in touch with these primal feelings. And, and, and in our culture, our entertainment has increasingly become more and more and more violent. So <laughs> economic disparity, racial relations, and then a culture that's just rife with violence. So you put all these things together, and then on top of that, you throw in the fear and the unknown of a pandemic. We don't know how long it's going to last. We don't know how many people are going to die. We don't know the ultimate impacts on the economy and our jobs and our schools and our churches. So there's this high anxiety there. So we've got anxiety over money and anxiety over race and anxiety over the, the violence that's in all these parts and anxiety over our, we don't know what's going to happen next. So it's not a surprise that the streets are on fire. It's not a surprise that the people that are there for our protection and to enforce laws, if it's done in the right way, they don't want violence. They don't want to have to go to these extremes. They are people too. And when they're put under the stress and the strain and the, and the tension of these moments, we can see what's happening is that the violence comes out and it's happening uh, on, on both sides. And it's so, it's, it's kind of tragic in a way because there's a very specific conversation about race that I wish we could have under circumstances 
where we didn't have so many other factors that were just piled on and creating all this, all this pressure. So we probably can't see it as clearly. However, if we didn't have those pressures, maybe we wouldn't bother to have these conversations. So I think as people of faith, we should be encouraged to, to look at to look at this moment and to ask ourselves what is leading up to this and what can we do to be a solution. And ultimately what we're gonna find, I think, where I end up is I, I end up leaning most heavily on my faith because the other, the other avenues are just, um, I know they may help, but as a person of faith, I'm looking for the big, 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 big picture solution, which means complete and total trust uh, in, in God. Now, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there's anything that you can take out of that, if there's any kind of, you know, if, the, if that helps. But uh, we're all thinking and feeling a lot of the same things in, in this moment. So let's transition from that into uh, a reading to from our, our book emotionally healthy spirituality day by day i'm going to look at page 93 and this is a this is a good one for us it kind of matches up with uh these major issues that we're dealing with and major anxieties and and our need to trust in god so i'm on page 93 this is week four day five uh, we're looking at the scripture taken from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. <laughs> Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. It's a short verse. So it's a short text. I'm going to read it one more time. Uh, this is one... This is a text that oftentimes I think we find ourselves coming back to when we go through very difficult times because we're looking for some kind of meaning and this gives us some kind of a, a sense of, of meaning. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, I'm not gonna take a show of hands because I can kind of guess how many hands are going to be raised. How many of you are experiencing pure joy in these trials that we are facing? This is our instruction, though. Consider it pure joy. So what that means is if we're not considering it pure joy, there's something in between that we need to, to understand, to work on, to figure out, to let go of. Um, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The testing of your faith. So I, I would refer us back to what I was saying earlier. I think the true test of faith maybe is not whether you have faith or not, but it is what do you have faith in? And if you are losing your faith, what are you losing your faith in? Uh, are you losing your faith in your expectations, in your understanding of God, in your beliefs, in your hopes? What are you losing faith in? Are you losing faith in the unknown and almighty God that is beyond all this, or are you losing faith in something else? Or can we use these tests to say, ooh, I think my faith was rooted in 
something other than God. I thought it was God and maybe it was close to God, but uh, this testing of your faith will kind of let you know where your faith is at. Let perseverance finish its work so that you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So there's a process. There's a process of losing your faith, getting reoriented, and, uh, and, then, and then having faith again in, in God. If any of you lacks wisdom, so lacking wisdom means you don't know what you have faith in, what you need to let go of. If, if you need wisdom, you should ask God and he gives generous without fault and it will be given to you. So God will give you what you need to work through this faith crisis. All right, that is that is James 1.5. Let me just look. I see a couple comments have popped up. Martin Luther wouldn't approve of the use of the book of James. All right, that is true. That is true. And there is much within the book of James. This is a comment by, by Jason. There is a lot in the book of James that is, quote, faith by works. All right. But what we are looking at is we're looking for that true faith, real faith, not faith in something other than God or what we think might be God, our box of God, but, but true faith. Uh, another comment here. Violence is primal and innate and we try to bear it, especially as people of faith, but at some point we need to face the fact that even Jesus lost his temper when people were misusing the temple. Uh, everything has its place and time. Just have to click for more. Everything has its place and time, and we really need to trust in God. I pray for his guidance and addressing it. I do not condone violence, but I need to faithfully understand the underlying causes and keep praying for his guidance and that I say and do and and all that I say and do may be for his purpose and good of all. Thank you for that comment, uh, Margaret. And it is it, it is a struggle. We do look, you know, we look particularly to the Gospels and the life of Jesus in the question of violence and we do see Jesus losing his temper in some places he picks up a whip uh, in some places, he's turning over tables. So we see this physical outburst of this energy. Uh, it never uses the word anger, I don't believe. Uh, but we can see by the actions that this is a typical kind of human response to, to frustration and anger and injustice. Now, uh, what, we, what we also see Jesus doing is this is actually is in the reading. We won't be able to get to it because I think it's the next reading. Um, when we see Jesus faced with the, the, the greatest threat of violence in, in the threat of crucifixion, the threat of arrest and torture and crucifixion, in the face of that, uh, when, when we see Peter draw the sword, and use it against someone, Jesus says to put it away. There's a, I understand there are other texts where Jesus says, you, you're gonna need the sword, uh, or I don't know if it's Jesus that says it, but there's, there's places that say that there's a need for the sword. You know, we, we go through, and the, the, the thing that we have to ask ourselves is, are we justifying a perspective that we want to hold on to, or are we really looking to learn and, uh, and, and grow and change and mature. And, and so we're asking God, tell, tell me what is right. Like the book of James here, if we, we need to ask God for wisdom for that. Um, there's always the question of should we defend ourselves from violence by using violence? And of course, of course, that's part of the question. It's, it's a huge, it's a huge topic. And I, uh, I'll, I'll say we'll come back to it because it's going to be something that we'll, we need to be kind of chewing on and thinking about for a while. Let's look a little bit further in our devotional. 
uh, into the comments of our author. If there were never any storms or clouds in our lives, we would have no faith. Nahum, the prophet, says, His way is in the whirlwind and the storm. The clouds are the dust of his feet. Clouds are a sign that God is there. What a revelation to know that sorrow, bereavement, and suffering are actually the clouds that come along with God. These are the, these are the types of readings that we, we, we engage in in the middle of crisis because we're kind of losing our sense of what's going on and we need to know what to do next. When everything's going right, these are probably not the types of readings that we turn to. <laughs> or that really make that much sense to us. This reading ends with a quote from Oswald Chambers. You may know Oswald Chambers from the devotional. It was very popular, my utmost for his highest. And this is a, a quote from him. <clears throat> it is not true to say that God wants to teach us something in our trials. Through every cloud he brings our way, he wants us to unlearn something. His purpose in using the cloud is to simplify our beliefs until our relationship with him is exactly that of a child, a relationship simply between God and our own souls where other people are but shadows. Until other people become shadows to us, clouds and darkness will be ours every once in a while. Is our relationship with God becoming more simple than it ever has been? Until we come face to face with the deepest, darkest fact of life, without damaging our view of God's character, we do not yet know him. That's one of those you have to rewind in the, in the video to listen to again. If you've got your books, it's page 93. I'd say read it over and over again. It's, he, he is saying God's not trying to teach you something. He's trying to help you to unlearn something. So along the way, as we get older and wiser and we kind of get things figured out, we kind of, we create this this beautiful perspective of now I can see life through the eyes of a wise and experienced person. And when we're looking at the life of faith, this is where the teachings about the faith of a child come into perspective. Oswald Chambers is here saying, everything that you've learned that informs your perspective you're going to have to question and unlearn and let go of in order to simply hold on to God like a child. To have a childlike faith. It's simple. I have faith in God and I don't know. That type of faith is real faith. Because what happens with that faith is that everything else fades and the priorities change and our sense of control, it, it, it fades, but then there is a peace that comes. It was a, in, in my experience of putting together the sermon for, for Sunday, I tried and tried and tried and 99% and of the time, an outline comes together, even if it's a, at the last minute. And I can't tell you exactly, but it's just wh whatever was going on inside of me and around me, I, I just could not bring myself to, to offer something in, in, a, in a teaching message. Offer something new. So this, this is like, you know, Oswald Chambers says we need to unlearn stuff. So often when we, when we come to the pulpit as pastors, we're adding another thing for people to learn. You know, let's add it to our, our big collection of the, 
the, the greatest teachings of wisdom, and then we can use that as our perspective to move forward as mature Christians and, and live a life for God. And then comes the faith crisis moments, and it was very uncomfortable to be in, but I'm so glad that I, that I had it myself, and I'm sure that I will continue to have these no matter how uncomfortable they are. You get to a place where you're just like, I have nothing to say, I know what I feel, and all I'm left with is I guess I'm just going to have to try this simple childlike faith that I was introduced to a long, long time ago. And when we say, I don't know, and I need you, and God, I have faith in you, and I don't have to know the answers, and I don't have to understand any, anything, when we have that, that is what faith is all about. Oswald Chambers here, he's talking about the process of shedding all these things. Shedding the belief that we can know more and grow. Shedding the belief that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're becoming better as, as humans or we're becoming worse as humans. All, all of these conclusions that we draw about life these are the things that we're asked to let go. Let go of all your conclusions, whether it's a positive conclusion or a negative conclusion, whatever you have concluded and figured out, it's time to unlearn that. It's time to get rid of that. It's time to, to let go of it and have trust in God and not know anything. And I tell you, when you get to that place, I've had, the last couple days, I've had a big sense of peace and relief. And yes, I can recognize, um, I can recognize all the challenges around and, and within, but I can say that having that kind of moment of release or even, um, it, it's, it's surrender in the sense of you just give up. I'm just, I'm, I'm done. I, and you're coming, you're coming to faith in God, not because you're pious, not because you have figured out that's the best solution. Usually it's just, it's just giving up and realizing it's the only thing that you have left. Now, hopefully when we feel ourselves losing faith, Realize that what that can be is it can be losing faith in the conclusions that we've reached about our faith experience. And that actually can be a good thing, maybe the best thing. What we, what we would be left with is just this childlike faith of complete and total dependence and, uh, and trust that God is going to God's going do God's going to do something and it's going to be okay. <laughs> and 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 we don't know and, and we don't know God's timetable or or the way that God works but we trust but we have faith uh, let's wrap up with uh, a prayer we have this question to consider page 94 what is the one thing God might want you to unlearn today that's a question for us to keep with us. And then here's our prayer. I'll read it, and it can be our closing prayer. Father, I confess that when difficulties and trials come into my life, large or small, I mostly grumble and complain. I realize the trials James talks about are not necessarily walls, but they're difficult to bear nonetheless. Fill me with such a vision of a transformed life, O oh God, that I might actually consider it pure joy when you bring trials my way. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen. Good closing prayer. <clears throat> we are people of faith, and what a joy it is for us to find real faith 
and to let go of what we thought might have been uh, faith. All right, let's sing our closing song. Send us out in the power of your Spirit, Lord. May our lives bring Jesus to the world. May each thought and word bring glory to your name. Send us out in your Spirit, Lord, we pray. Send us out in the power of your Spirit, Lord. so much for being here today. You can watch this video again and you can share it with people. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining in and let's have faith, that real faith, the faith that makes all the difference. God bless you and keep you. Have a wonderful day and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.